Okay, that is better now. There you go, Akil popping up again. So, um, what I want to do today is I will talk to you about structured light and structured atoms, and of course, the remit about talking about the vision for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, since my first postdoc position, and possibly even earlier, I've been really interested in the optical angular momentum of light and more generally in structured light beams. Um, which can be structured in amplitude, phase, and polarization as well. And on this slide, I've summarized this work with two pictures from the lab. At the left-hand side, you see a vector light mode that we've generated in our lab, which shows spatially designed mode profiles. And what you see here is that this one light beam actually has different uh, polarization components in it. Uh, the red bits are right-handed circular polarized, the blue ones are left-handed circular polarized, and the different ellipses, of course, show you exactly what you expect they would show you if you're familiar with polarization at all, which I'm sure you are, given that you're attending this series here. So we can make these light beams. I'm going to explain the color scheme a little bit later on. And then what you can do if you, once you've got light that is structured in its polarization, you can make it, you can investigate, of course, you can build applications and what we are particularly interested in is the interaction of such light beams with atoms, with cold atoms. And here I have um, an image of our structured atoms, um, which have interacted where we, with, with, a, with a vector polarized light beam. And we have designed polaritons in this atomic cloud of cold atoms. And uh, you see that we can design the atomic transparency, the opacity of the atoms. Um, point by point or region of region um, when they interact with our structured light beam. Why do we do all this? Well, let's start with the light. If we can do this structured light, I guess the first thing we need to think about is how can we actually detect what we have. So we're interested in doing spatially resolved vector tomography of our light beams. And once we've done that, you can go into different avenues. You can investigate fundamental principles like spin orbit coupling. So the coupling between spin orbital angular momentum, which is polarization and orbital angular momentum, which is of course the orbit. Ideas of contextuality, which is the little sister of quantum entanglement in the classical world. But also we can develop uh, interesting devices. So we've developed a one-shot polarimetric device and we are interested in looking at enhanced resolution or specific uh, resolution uh, when using light beams with a varying polarization profile. Once the light interacts with the atoms, we can investigate vectorial light matter interaction. We can design spin polaritons in the atomic sample. And if we do so, what we, what we do, no doubt, is we entangle in some way the light and the atoms polarization profile of the light with the polariton profile of the atom, or the, even it's the ground state profile of the atom, if you so want. And there, the longer prospect, again, would be applications possibly. So you can generate reconfigurable atom optical elements that are dictated by an interacting light beam. And on the other, we can do atomtronics. Atomtronics is an emerging, emerging area of atomic research, a bit similar to spintronics. And if we actually have vector fields that interact with the atoms, Maybe we can do kind of a combination between spin and atomtronics, some kind of vector atomtronics. As the remit for all of this, and I'm going to do that a bit upside down compared to what Akil suggested, is I'm going to give you, I'm going to start with thinking about a vision for the next decade or two. And it's a hard question. I've actually discussed that with a group of my PhD students, with RAs and with colleagues, and if asked them, what, what do you think will happen in the next one or two decades of structured light? There are lots of different answers, all very good answers. So one of my PhD students suggested maybe it will go more multidisciplinary. Maybe we're going to look and see more applications in biochemistry and engineering and condensed matter. One of my more senior colleagues suggested that all along we always think about quantum communication if we think about structured light, if you think about the different modes that are uh, intrinsic to these kind of light beams, we're building an information capacity for the 21st century. You could think, obviously, that as in so many other areas of optics, we could maybe apply machine learning to make new structures that are even better than our old structures. 
uh, something that is happening already a lot at the moment is to try and find classical analogs to quantum protocols, which are based really only on the vector potential of light. And then maybe more of a real game changer for everything would be if we could find a really efficient way to generate these arbitrary light modes. We're quite good at designing them ourselves. We get very good fidelity, but it's incredibly inefficient. So most of the light is not put into the mode that we are interested in. If we had fantastic devices that allow us to do that on a single photon level, then this would open up the whole world for uh, really quantum devices as well. Now, of course, it, it's not only down to what my PhD students and me want to do, but in the end, we always need to kind of have some realistic idea about it as well. So I assume what will happen will need to be defined by where we get the funding from. This will be defined quite likely by the needs and technologies. So it seems at the moment that if we would find good applications in sensing and metrology in ideally biomedical applications, someone might give us money to do that. Um, even without the technologies involved, I think what will happen will of course be guided by roadmaps, by great challenges, and to some extent by fashionable science. Okay, the question is, is this actually visionary? It's not really. It's just extrapolating from today, and that's as good as it gets, apart from maybe some of these game changer ideas. And game changer ideas cannot be predicted. They just happen if you're lucky. So there you go. A um, bit of a pessimistic view, maybe. Another view of, uh, well, not a pessimistic view, but a pessimistic view of me being able to deliver to you a fantastic vision of what will happen. Of course, um, hindsight is always better. And one way to think about it is to think what happened in the past and where does it, did that lead us today? In the area that I'm researching, one of the really key papers is a key publication about a generation of optical angular momentum in light beams of Lagia Gauss beams. And that was done in uh, 1992. It's a paper published in Physical Review A, not in Nature or Science or anything like that, note. Um, by Les Allen and Han Wertmann. And if you look at what happened to all of these publications, you can see that actually in the first 10 years, not much happened. It was noticed, but it wasn't majorly noticed. But if you look at the long prospect of this one paper, you see that it's a, it's, it's a long burner. It's a fantastic paper that got lots and lots of citations. It's really taking off. It's, it's taking over not only optics, but it's spread to different areas. And that's why we see so many publications there. You might think that, and I, I honestly think that at the time when Les published this work, he did not foresee whatsoever what would happen in the next 10, 20 years. He'd be probably gobsmacked if he knew. He'd, and, and I'm glad that he managed to see quite a lot of that uh, during his life. You might think this is just an exception. So let's look at a different paper, again, slightly related, not, not as much related to what I'm doing, but slightly related. Let's look at non-diffracting beams. So this is an idea published in 1979 by Michael Berry and a colleague. And this is even worse. Look at that. For the first 30 years, pretty much nothing happened. Nobody knew this existed. It was just a curious little effect that was spotted for quantum optics for the Schrödinger equation and nobody really noticed what happened. And then all of a sudden this idea takes off and if you're reading journals, for me I see that as an editor of, of a journal, you see so many papers about non-diffracting beams. They're, they're un uncountably many it seems sometimes. So it's really a big question at the moment. It's a big thing. Why did it take so off, uh, off, off so, so strongly from 2007? Well, that was the first really experimental realization. So it's not a complete um, freak of nature that something happened at that time. Good, so in the past, you can spot the good papers. And once you've got your uh, web of science open, another thing you can do is you can actually check what happened with these research areas at the moment. And if you just search for where do where, where do people publish about the optical and angular momentum of light? Then you see that this is really a diverse area, same for airy beams. These are really diverse research areas where people are cited transcending pure optics. So there are citations in engineering, multidisciplinary, material science, optical angular momentum is cited in astronomy, airy beams are cited in mechanics, both have 
effects on nanoscience. So that maybe is in hindsight a good indication that something is really a fantastic work. So with all of this caveat, and because we don't know what happens in uh, 2040 or 2050, I'm going to tell you a little bit of what we're doing at the moment at Glasgow and what we want to do in future. So here's my belated outline. I've told you already there's no really vision that I can, I can provide you with. I will now proceed to give you an introduction to structured light and uh, tell you a little bit of our current work that we're doing at the moment. I'm going to give you a very brief outline about my personal vision and then hopefully in the time afterwards during the questions we can maybe investigate a bit also what are your visions for this work. So let's start. Oops. So structured light, if you think about structured light, is more than what you can see. If you have a light beam, it's an electromagnetic field, you've got information in its amplitude. And the bit that we can see is, of course, just the intensity. Our eyes are only sensitive to the intensity of the light. There's information, however, also in the phase. So the phase that is related to the intensity profile that I'm showing you here actually shows vortices. And I'm showing here a phase profile. The phase profile um, has uh, the different colors as associated with different phases. And you see that the center of this light beam has a charge three vortex. So the phase is evolving around the center three times from zero to two pi, and then it's back again and it's surrounded by a number of uh, single uh, charge vortices as well. You would not be able to see that if you spot the light beam, you are not able to see whether there are actually vortices in the center or whether it's just an intensity minimum. And then, of course, light is an electromagnetic wave. There's polarization attached to that as well. And here's a beam that we generated in the lab that has this spatially varying polarization. I've showed you the same beam before already. So if I'm thinking of a paraxial beam, then I would have two components of my electric field vector, and I can shape the amplitude and phase of both of these independently, and that means that I can generate a structured polarization beam. I give this to you here first in just x, y, and z, but of course, in principle, for the beams that we are interested in, you can use any coordinate system that you want, and one that is quite suggestive for our rotational symmetric structures that we use a lot is just a cylindrical basis. And in this case, again, I can have an amplitude, I've got phase, and I've got polarization information all in one go. It's actually more than that, because in principle, our light, of course, lives in 3D, electromagnetic fields live in 3D. So we have actually even three polarization components. It's difficult to access the third one in paraxial beam at least. And it's even better than that because all of this is not true only for light beams, but it's actually true for a single photon as well. So I could have a single photon shaped in 3D in the amplitude and phase of the three different polarization components. The challenge is how to generate this and how to detect it. And that is not at all clear yet. So that maybe goes a little bit towards my vision. My vision would be to explore the full 3D vectorial light field. And that's necessary if you think about conventional optics, um, think about imaging or atom optics, communication, tweezing, whatever you want. This is largely concerned just with the intensity and to a lesser extent the phase of light that is homogeneously polarized. So we don't really care about polarization in many cases. But what if we do? And we already know now that if we do care about polarization, we can get, for example, um, better focusing. We get additional possibilities to investigate what we're doing. We can investigate iris and birefringence, polarization spectroscopy. But I think what we're missing a little bit is a larger framework for all of that. In quantum optics, it's almost the other way around. In quantum optics, conventionally, you're concerned only with polarization and don't worry at all about the spatial dimension of the light beams. Although, of course, we all know that we can use spatial light modes. Quite often, a lot of the demonstrations that we've seen in the past are limited to only a two-dimensional subspace of the infinite dimensional space of spatial states. And again, also here, there are, of course, uh, some efforts to go beyond that. 
there is a recent review paper by Treps and Fabre this morning in our group. Actually, we've heard a talk by uh, Jack Romero from um, from Queen's University, who is doing a high dimensional quantum process tomography. There are some notable proofs of concept, but generally, uh, vectors is the main thing. The spatial light beams are not so much a thing yet. And 3D, I believe, has not really been done at all. Maybe for a very good reason. Let's find out. But let's forget about the vectors from, for the moment. Let's think about the spatial profiles that we can have. If you've got a paraxial beam, so generally you need to solve the Maxwell equation and uh, find a wave equation or Helmholtz equation. And from that, you can find out what are the allowed mode families that you can be working with. And if we're in the paraxial regime, then you can have Hami Gauss modes, you can have Lagier Gauss modes, or its overarching theme, the Inns Gauss modes and elliptical coordinates uh, on the, the left-hand side here. But then, of course, you could also have airy beams, and airy beams are non-diffracting solutions of the paraxial Helmholtz equation. These are self-healing, they are self-bending, uh, they, they propagate along curved trajectories in free space without being subjected to an external force, um, but they can't bend very far because then they would leave the paraxial regime. If you instead are concerned with non-paraxial beams, there's this whole family of bessel weber mathieu beams. Uh, if we combine them, we can get optical bullets. If we shape the time as well as the, the spatial uh, dimension. And again, we can have superpositions of all of these. So that's the nice thing of uh, Maxwell's equations because they're linear. All the superpositions of these light modes are still light modes that work as well. Let me just very, very briefly point out two recent papers that I think are interesting in this context. So here's one by Alexander Samait from Rostock, who published a work about long range self-healing Bessel beams, these helicon beams. And the fantastic thing about this is that usually when you're paraxial, you're limited to only very short propagation distance. So they managed in their lab instead to generate self-healing helicon beams, which are longer than a meter, they just propagate Another nice paper from recent, uh, very recent years, the SAMA is by Mark Dennis and Cornelia Dens, a collaboration where they investigate all kinds of uh, these propagation invariant light beams in terms of caustics. So an interesting concept. In our labs, however, we're really boring. We are only concerned with Lagia Gauss modes almost entirely. And uh, here's an image of the phase profile of the Lagia Gauss modes. And you see very clearly this uh, phase dependence of the light beam, um, where the phase varies as you go across the azimuthal angle. These are associated with kind of donut structures when they propagate. And uh, the phase fronts of these are twisted. And the pointing vectors shown here as these black uh, twisted lines show you the energy transfer of these beams. And that really shows you how they can um, they're related to orbital angular momentum, they're related to a transfer of angular momentum in the, in the um, azimuthal direction. So the nice thing is that these beams um, have a finite energy, they're very easy to produce in the lab. Um, well, we, we, we just like them. So here's a, a whole or a very small subsection of the infinite dimensional set of the Lagia Gauss modes, our bread and butter in the lab. Um, they are characterized by two mode indices, P and L. Um, I'm not really sure I need to tell you very much about it. Maybe the nice thing of all of this is, as I've mentioned before, that due to the linearity of the Maxwell equation, all two oppositions of these modes are also suitable modes. And that means that they effectively are suitable as quantum states as well. So a different way to say that is that any paraxial light beam can be expressed as a superposition of these modes with an appropriate weighting between them. So again, we've got the amplitudes and the associated phase with that. Uh, once you've got those modes, we can very easily generate our own vector modes, at least on paper in theory. If we want to generate our, if we want to design our own vector mode, what we need to do is we need to shape the spatial, um, the spatial mode in the X polarization or the horizontal polarization and the spatial mode of the Y polarization independently and then overlap them. So if we take our favorite spatial degree of freedom, in our case, the Lagia Gauss modes, and uh, compose and, and, and transfer the horizontal part in one mode and the vertical part in a different mode, 
And when we overlap them again afterwards, we get exactly these kind of beams. So the one that you see here is a, I think, a, a, a lemon um, structure uh, of a Poincaré beam. Very briefly, the color scheme that we are using, um, you're probably not familiar to that. We invented that ourselves in our mode and in our in our sorry in our labs. What we're doing here is, if you think about polarizations, you might be familiar with the normal Stokes parameters or the different polarization measurements. So here's a mutually unbiased basis where in the top row you've got horizontal, vertical, then you've got diagonal, anti-diagonal, and right and left and circular polarized line. On the Poincaré sphere, these are situated, if you so want, at the six corners of the Poincaré sphere, so the two poles and four positions across the equator. But of course, light beams can or light modes can exist in any superposition of those states as well. And in order to show that in, uh, in color, uh, in, in, in our images nicely, we've just wrapped the whole Poincaré sphere into a color map where every color is uniquely identifying one particular polarization direction. And if we do that, we can just color code our polarization images and you can immediately see what's going on. So here's another set of mutual unbiased bases of rotationally symmetric states. And, um, Obviously, we can generate any kind of modes. So these are Poincaré beams, which wrap the whole Poincaré sphere one or multiple times into, uh, in, into, into the beam profile. How do you do them in the lab? Very easy, with hindsight again. In order to do that, we need to shape two orthogonal polarizations independently. And the way how we do that is we take a diagonally polarized laser beam, split it into its horizontal and vertical component with a, with a Wollaston prism. And both of these then independently impinge on a DMD, which shows a multiplexed hologram. And each of those, uh, each parts of these holograms uh, find, produce in the first diffraction order a light beam that is shaped exactly the way how we want it. And um, so, for example, if we shape the horizontal part in terms of a Hermit Gauss 1 0 mode and the vertical part in terms of a Hermit Gauss 0 1 mode. If we overlap them again, we get our characteristic intensity profile and the polarizations associated with that is an azimuthally polarized beam. Instead, if we just swap the spatial modes of the horizontal and vertical direction, we get the radial polarized beam. In the same way, we can make any beam we want. So very convenient. Once you've got such a beam, what can you do with that? So one question we ask ourselves is this whole question of the analogy to quantum entanglement. Of course, this is an individual light mode, there's no entanglement there, but there is something that is akin to entanglement and that's non-separability. So if we generate our light beam, just any vector beam, we can decompose that in terms of the spatial component and the polarization component. And if we write that in the suggestive way, as I do here, then it looks almost like a quantum state. And here horizontal and vertical are orthogonal to each other, the two Spatial light modes are orthogonal to each other as well. So that kind of corresponds to a Bell state of sorts, the classical analogy of a Bell state. More generally, however, you could have any kind of beam. And the question is, how contextual is this? How non-separable is this light mode? And the nice thing that we figured out is that the degree of contextuality, which is a concept borrowed from quantum theory, works also for these, uh, for, for these vector beams. So whatever is entanglement in the class in the quantum world is vectorness in our world of structured light beams. And we can determine the concurrence of beams. We can measure the, the, the contextuality um, by, by the measure of concurrence. And we can determine that by just having global Stokes parameter measurements. The fact that they're global and we don't need to do a full tomography of the beams was actually a bit of a surprise to us. Because it's, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? The polarization is determined in a two-dimensional state space, but our polarization, so our spatial modes are taken out of an infinite dimensional state space. So doing projection measurements is prohibitive. We don't know which of the many, many, infinitely many beams uh, we need to investigate in projection measurements. This out of interest, the kind of concurrences we get in our beams are close to one, but not quite one. So generally, vector beams can mimic quantum behavior, but not non-locality. And the race really is on in order to find interesting protocols where our classical beams are, are useful. Other things where 
phase and polarization structure is useful or very important is really in all situations where we are interested in interference. And interference in its widest sense is, is responsible for a lot in optics. So if you take diffraction through an aperture or scattering, that yes. all is in a way a, a variety of interference. If you've got aberrations, if you've got dispersion or dichroism, and very importantly for us as well, if you've got any kind of nonlinear interaction, these all depend on something akin to interference effects. And they become, uh, in, in, that, in these cases, you can imagine if uh, you've got phase differences between your different parts of the beams for interference, then that really becomes noticeable and turns into intensity differences. Similarly, if you've got polarization profiles, if you've got polarization structured light, interference of these beams, again, shows a lot more structure than if the polarization would be homogeneous. The area where I am very interested in is when we're thinking about nonlinear interaction. If you do that in crystals, which you can, like any wave plate does that in, in some way, um, or any parametric down conversion would do that as well, but it is usually not very efficient. But if we take atoms, we can generate very, very efficient nonlinear interactions. And moreover, if you've got atoms, then atoms are not a passive optical element, but, but they are active as well. So our atomic structures can be modified by its interaction with a polarized, polarization structured light beam and in turn influence the behavior of the, the propagation of the light. So you've got this kind of cycle the light determines what the atoms are doing and the atoms determine how the light is propagating. So we've got an active optical element. In order to really study that, unfortunately, you need to do a little bit more in the lab. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to tell you this now. I meant to tell you this later. There's actually some more light that I wanted to talk to you about first. My apologies. So let's take back a step. I just very briefly want to tell you about a different way how we can make structured light. And this was in a way a bit of a chance discovery. So this work was inspired by work from Mansuri Puradal, who published a paper in 2011 about the spin and orbital angular momentum of light as it's reflected by a cone. In their case, it's just a metal cone. And once we read that, we thought, well, why don't we do instead total internal reflection? Because that gives us, it's, it's, it's far easier to do in the lab. And what we figure out is if we do this and we shine a linearly polarized beam into our cone, it's totally internally reflected in the inside. And when it comes back, it carries polarization information with it. It was something we built in the lab. We immediately saw it worked. And then it took years to properly understand all the little details that are associated with that. Very typical for work, I guess. So what it all boils down to really is the idea that as Fresnel already knew, now not only decades ago, but centuries ago, that in total internal reflection, light acquires a phase shift, and the phase shift depends on the polarization direction relative to the glass surface. Um, if we now have a cone symmetry of our glass surface, this phase shift varies around the beam profile, and that leads to polarization structured light. Um, this is a fact that, of course, is known since Fresnel's times. It's known to microscopists as definitely known to manufacturers of optical elements. But nevertheless, it was kind of new to us and we really liked the idea. So here again is, uh, if, you, if you see what's happening here, then in the vertical component, our light is in, entirely um, S-polarized and it remains S if it continues on its way down. Along the horizontal, it's entirely P-polarized and it it's still people when it comes back, but it requires a phase shift of pi. And instead, if you go along the diagonal, there yeah, the light has equal parts of S and P polarization. And due to the refractive indices and the, the, total, the Fresnel equations of glass, uh, it just so happens that the phase shift between those two different components effectively acts like a quarter wave plate. And that is why we get all this particular polarization structured light. It's fantastic. It's broadband. It works across the whole visual spectrum. It works with almost 100% efficiency. But the downside is that the only light mode that we can generate from that is one particular mode, one particular superposition of, of different spatial modes. <laughs>
So what we ended up after that is we've got this fantastic beam and we're looking for applications. And we were very lucky because when we published our paper, we actually got a phone call by someone working in a company of Gucci and Hausko, um, an optical element manufacturing company. And uh, they have since then been working together with us, uh, with us on these ideas, trying to build devices. The first time in my life I'm doing something useful in science, we might actually come up with interesting devices. We started by thinking about super resolution because it's very well known that if you take a radial polarized light beam, for example, and you focus that really strongly, then the polarization acquires a Z component and there's interference between these different parts of the light coming from the different sections of, uh, of the light profile as, as we start. And it so happens that light like that can be focused better than homogeneously polarized light. What surprised us is that our beam actually works even better than conventional radial polarized light beams, which have opposite light modes in those two um, polarization components. You can turn that upside down as well, if you so want. So if you think about the cone, what the cone does, it does a unitary transformation. So it turns homogeneously polarized light into polarization structures. And if you analyze them after a polarizer, then you see intensity profiles. So what we found out is that if you just analyze the intensity profile after a polarizer, after a cone, you can actually completely determine the full Stokes parameters, a full polarization state of the light that went in. It's as good as commercial devices, it is broadband, it's single shot. So we really like that and we are keen to do more work on these ideas. You don't need to do applied stuff. Sometimes you get lucky and you've got colleagues working in quantum theory who can see beyond the direct applications. So here's an idea, here's a, a work that we developed together with uh, our friends in, in quantum theory. And we've just very recently published a paper on optical skirmion beams. I say we really, we just, uh, we just uh, gave some, some ideas of how it would work in, in, in the experiments. All the theory is down to our theorists. But the bit that we saw in the beginning is if we come in with an azimuthally polarized light beam and we just truly transform that with a weekly focusing lens, then you see this, this transformation of light where we come up, we, we, we start with a beam that is just azimuthally polarized, which on the Poincaré sphere is just a, a ring around the equator. And afterwards we end up with a full Poincaré beam. And the question of these things are happening is what is the conserved quantity? What is, what is going on here? And one of the conserved quantities is the skirmion number of the beam, which does not change for all of these different beams. So watch that space. I'm really excited by that. I don't really know what's going to happen. Now, finally, the slide that I expected many slides before about our atoms. So here's our atomic setup. This is a fairly standard magneto-optical trap. We trap about 10 to the 8 atoms at about 100 microkelvin, which then hang there just in free space and are available to investigation. What's a little bit different about our trap is that we load them in a magneto-optical trap and then uh, transfer them into a spontaneous optical uh, force trap, spot trap. And that leaves us atoms in a state that is, first of all, completely decoupled from the light and second of all, in a state that is nicer for us. Why do we do all of this? It's hard. We've got a vacuum system. We've got a magnetic system. We need extremely precise lasers compared to free space optics. Well, I've told you before, we see huge nonlinear effects. We get a very highly efficient light matter interaction. And our atoms also can be altered by magnetic fields. So we've got just another parameter to play with. We've done a lot of work with different atoms in our lab in the, in the past. But the only thing really that I'd like to talk to you about is exactly the one where we are interacting our atoms with structured light. All the others are concerned with intensity structures, with phase structures. Here's a really nice work done together with, uh, with colleagues at Strasbourg University. It's brilliant, but I do not have time today to talk about it. So this is what we will talk about today. So the idea here is that I've got, I've got my atoms, then they are sensitive to the light field. They are sensitive to in fact, the polarization structure and the light, because of course the atoms themselves come in orbitals and the orbitals respond differently to different polarization structures of the light. They're driven by different polarization components of the light. 
but the atoms are also sensitive to magnetic fields. So here's a very schematic sketch of what we are doing. We come in with a light beam that has a polarization structure. Our polarization structure here has a positive and negative angular momentum in the two different um, polarization components, the two different right and left-handed polarization components. But because polarization components, they are orthogonal to each other and uh, they don't interfere, what you see is really just the donut ring that corresponds exactly to uh, one of these lagia like gauss modes. But secretly in this ring is encoded a polarization profile that is invisible to the eye, but not invisible to the atoms. Here's a very, very stylized uh, image of our, of our atom atomic cloud. Imagine that these are 10 to the eight uh, individual atoms trapped at 100 microkelvin. Uh, we're working in the five to S one half state, that's our ground state. And this light now is interacting with our atoms and it's also interacting with the magnetic field. So I've got a magnetic field. We can have a magnetic field only along the direction of propagation that leads to a Zeeman shift in the atoms, but we can also have light in a transverse direction to the light propagation and that couples the ground states of the atoms. So this is how this looks like, our whole atomic system. The magnetic field, the transverse part of it, couples the ground states that we have here and the, the, the sigma plus and sigma minus component, the right and left hand component of the light, couple the two different transitions between the MF minus one state and the MF plus one state each and the zero state in the pop here. So what we get is some kind of interferometer. We've got two optical transitions and the magnetic transitions here, and they determine the propagation of the light through the sample. And what all of that adds up to is that at some places, the light beam is absorbed as you would normally expect. So we've got light that is very near resonance with our atoms. Our atomic sample is optically very, very dense. So the light should be absorbed. Nevertheless, at some places instead, at different polarization structures, at different polarization directions, the light is not, or is, is not, not absorbed or very little absorbed. So we get what is called spatially it's, it's called uh, electromagnetically induced transparency. Really what it means in simple words is that we can uh, determine the opacity of an atomic medium by pumping it with different light. The light beam is a weak probe beam only. It pumps both of these transitions all in one particular light beam, uh, just different components of the same light beam. And this is an idea that is kind of important because it means we don't get dephasing that you would get if you would use different transitions for those two different light beams. So overall, what we can do here is we can imprint polarization information onto the atomic orbitals and we can observe that directly as a spatially dependent um, transparency of our cold vapor. The experiments we've done here have been done with Q plates, which is just yet another way to generate polarization structure light. And our friends in Italy gave us not only one, but lots of different Q plates. And you see the effect that we get with components where we've got here um, L of plus minus two components, four, six, 12, 24, and L being plus minus 200. And the images you see here are absorption images of our atoms, absorption spectroscopy of our atoms. And then the one uh, with an L of plus minus 200, we see 400 interference fringes, um, all imprinted in an individual atomic cloud of a few millimeters. Published quite some time ago, since then we've tried to optimize the magnetic field and that took us a lot longer than we, uh, that, that maybe it should have. But what we can do now is we can actually determine uh, we, we can change the magnetic field and, and can observe the effect of that. So if you change the magnetic field, just the transverse component, so the azimuthal angle of the magnetic field, um, then it, if you rotate the magnetic field around the beam direction axle, then it rotates the absorption profile um, as well. And I think this should rotate. So this is experimental data. You see how the, how the image just rotates, absorption image rotates as we rotate the magnetic field. The bit that we didn't immediately anticipate is the idea that if we change the inclination angle of the magnetic field, then that leads to a splitting of these lobes that we see. 
And overall, again, we have some kind of one-shot device, one-shot atomic compass, if you so want. So just by, 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 by investigating the absorption pattern, we think that we have enough information to find out about the alignment of the magnetic fields that we have here. So we can deduce the magnetic field alignment from a one-shot absorption measurement. It's quite nicely with the kind of uh, simulations that we do as well. And you see uh, in the simulation as well that the rotation angle um, changes the speed with which our patterns are rotating, for example. So what we're doing on a theory level, and maybe this is going beyond what you want to hear in, in, a, in optics and photonics talk, is uh, we, we can solve optical block equations and we can, can combine that with propagation equations. We can um, do that quite, quite nicely. We can get good results uh, for, for what we're seeing. But what is easier is just to do Fermi's golden rule. And if you think back to your undergrad days, maybe you've heard about that at some point. Or if you're working in atom optics, you might be very, very familiar with that. If we calculate the Fermi's golden rule, which just tells us how likely is a particular, how, how likely is it for the light to be absorbed, then we can see that this probability of absorption depends on the magnetic field direction on the azimuthal and, uh, and inclination angle of the magnetic field. And if we do a Fourier analysis of all of this, then we can actually um, develop that in terms of the different Fourier components of the light structures that we are seeing. And the prefactors of these various bits then tell us something about the magnetic field. So from measuring the phase of the 2L Fourier component, so this is the 2L Fourier component, measuring the phase of that gives us an information of the azimuthal angle of the magnetic field. And if we do that uh, in our measurements, then we can see that that uh, quite nicely works. So we've got here showing the exactly the phase of the 2L Fourier component. And if we change the azimuthal angle, we get this relatively linear uh, correspondence between the two. If you want to deduce uh, the inclination angle, it's a little bit harder. In that case, we are looking at the amplitude of the 4L component. And that, at least in a very simple simulation, gives us a sign to the 4 of theta b. The function that you see here is actually not exactly a sign to the 4 of theta b. It's more like a sign to the 3. And uh, that uh, is not exactly what we see from our very simple Fermi golden rule equation, but we do find that in simulations uh, from our optical block equations. And with this, I'm really coming pretty much to my end. So after I told you a little bit more about what we are doing, I can tell you at least what's my personal vision, what, what, what are things I'm excited to do over the next decade or two. Well, two, maybe I'm retired, but... Uh, at least for the next few years. Um, if I'm interested in looking at the, this, this vector light, I'm interested to look at vector light in 3D really. And I do think just as my PhD student predicted that there will be interesting applications in technology. There'll be challenges in interdisciplinary technology for inertial sensing, for enhanced imaging, for polarimetry. For the atom side, I am really excited to see more of Victoria light matter interaction. That is really a merging field at the moment. There's a lot that can be studied and I hope that we can take part of that in our group here as well. Longer term, I really hope to see more applications in atomtronics, again, one of these emerging fields in spintronics as well, uh, to really not only look at the, the, the atomic densities, but look at polarization states, at spin states, at spin polaritons, and how they can be used for, for well, the equivalence to, to electronics, equivalence to circuits, um, or, or even new things that we haven't thought of in the past. What I think really is an exciting area as well as just fundamental science. I think we should look into uncertainty relations, into resolution limits, into quantum protocols, into classical analogs to quantum protocols, and ultimately uh, looking at vector photons in 3D and what we can do with them. So that's kind of my science view of what I like to do. There are a few other things I'm interested in as well. I like to be a good mentor to my PhD students and my, my RAs. And even if uh, some papers recently suggest that women can't do that, I don't think that's true. I think we can be very good mentors. And I'm really, really pleased to see so many of my 
students and uh, former students are still being in contact. I, I really, really enjoy interacting with them. And I like, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for their continued support of the work that we're doing at the moment. I like to do anything I can in order to foster inclusivity and research a big, a big challenge of us ahead. Big thank you to all my group. So here are the people who are, uh, this is a whole optics group. You see many other people here that you'll see later during this week as well, if you attend Miles Patch's talk, for example. But the people uh, with the little, with little name tags to it are the people who are working more directly with me. And the uh, ones in dark colors and darker blue are working on the atoms, when in lighter colors are working in optics, on the optics, free space optics uh, predominantly. And as I've said, I am very grateful to my colleagues who, um, well, those three who have all been working in our group in the past, have now gone elsewhere and are still in contact with us at times. So with that, uh, I, I thank you for your attention. And here's just a rundown of some of the uh, papers that we've published more recently in this area and that are maybe relevant to this talk. So thank you. That actually is not only for science, it's just an important time of your life. This is a, the time where you really develop your own, I don't know, scientific career, but you might, this might be the time where you find a partner that you have for the rest of your life or you start your family. It's super important. Make the most of it. Make friends. The friends you make now might be your future collab collaborators and networkers but they just simply might be friends and you might be still in contact with them. I'm still in contact with a lot of the people I studied with together and I went to conferences with together in, in the early days. And it's fantastic to see them progressing through the system as well. Do science beyond your own topic. Be curious. Try to, try to learn. Try to, try to be, be happy about it and have a life. <laughs>